Hello and welcome. Fresh signals emerge on the president's readiness to sign the reworked electoral bill on Friday after earlier indications that it may happen today failed. Frosty relations between Zampara governor and his second-in-command culminate in the impeachment of the deputy governor Alil Gusso by the State House of Assembly as new deputy governor is sworn in. National Assembly receives constitutional amendment reports from the Senate and the House of Committees as First Lady visits both chambers to witness laying of the reports. And United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres warns that the world is facing a moment of peril over the Ukraine and Russia tension. We also have international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, House of Representatives calls for investigation into rising incidents of fake insurance certificate issuance in the country. And on sports news tonight, nine-time African champions, the Super Falcons of Nigeria, beat Cote d'Ivoire 1-0 in Abidjan to qualify for the 2022 Women's Africa Cup of Nations 3-0 on aggregate. From Abuja, the legal battle between Senator Rocha Sokorocha and the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission is far from over. The former Imo State Governor denies evading court service. Nigerians may now look forward to the signing of the reworked Electoral Act Amendment Bill on Friday, February the 25th, 2022. A close source to the presidency who had earlier indicated that the signing would take place today said that the new date would be honoured by the president. Meanwhile, the president has sworn in six national commissioners of the Independent National Electoral Commission just before the commencement of the Federal Executive Council meeting today. The council meeting was attended by the President of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives, whose presence at the time gave an indication that the signing of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill by the President was going to take place. Our State House correspondent Gloria Humezoke reports. The presence of the President of the Senate, Mr. Amit Lawan, and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Femi Bajabiamila, at the Council Chamber was an initial indication that the President would finally append his signature on the re-amended Electoral Act Amendment Bill, but all speculations were brought to a halt moments after. The President instead swore in six National Electoral Commissioners of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, before the commencement of the Council meeting. After the brief ceremony, the Chairman of INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, told State House correspondents that the Commission would henceforth ramp up ongoing efforts. It's coming three days to uh, by elections in four states of the federation and as we plan for the Echitian Oshun governorship elections and then as we continue to prepare for the 2023 general elections. We will go on firing on all cylinders. Uh, now that we have the full complement of commissioners, and Nigeria should expect the best out of the commission. The council meeting then proceeded behind closed doors. A recent report released by the National Bureau of Statistics indicating a 3.98% growth in gross domestic product was discussed. The Minister of State for Budget and National Planning notes that in spite of the recent growth, the federal government will continue to improve on the nation's inflation rate. The economy is being worked on. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, I can't uh, uh, give you a definitive date when inflation is going to be below uh, uh, 10%. The Minister of Works and Housing also addressed the consistent traffic gridlock on the Abuja Cafe Expressway, appealing to commuters for patience. Almost about uh, 15 to 20,000 vehicles, if not more, use that corridor now almost on a daily basis. We wish we could shut it down so that we can have uninterrupted construction uh, and the prisoners. But unfortunately, that's not possible. So while we manage traffic, people have to drive through a construction site we're building. So please bear with us. We will do the best that we can. 
The Council also approved a revised science, technology and innovation policy instituted 10 years ago. The minister explains that it is aimed at improving the standard of living of Nigerians. We believe that this will help our country to keep narrowing the gap between us and the technologically developed countries of the world. We should be able also to overtake the way nations like uh, China you know, has done. A total of 58 billion Naira contract awards was also approved by the Federal Executive Council for projects under the Ministry of Works and Housing as well as the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. From the Presidential Villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the Ibo state governor has described as unnecessary the pressure mounted on the president by opposition parties and some Nigerians to sign the amended electoral bill. According to Governor Hopu Zodima, the 1999 constitution as amended has defined the process of signing a bill into law and none of the processes have been violated by the president. On the March the 26th National Convention of the All Progressives Congress, the governor says it's best for the national chairman to come through the consensus mode, as has always been the practice. I don't understand the anxiety and the propaganda of uh, trying to force the president or blackmail the president into uh, signing an electoral act without uh, uh, following the constitutional uh, dictates by ensuring that he will study the electoral act. He has the mandate of all of us, over 200 million Nigerians. He will study the act, and if there are things in his opinion, he considers not to the best interest of the people. He has to address it, because today he's the president. So all this uh, social club and uh, anxieties here and there is not the best thing. I think we should allow the president to do his job. We watch televisions, we see people Making all transits here and there, president must sign, president must sign. Of course, you know that the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended, has expressly defined the process of making laws. And none of those processes has been violated. And if you follow clearly the history of APC from its section, the Bayodia chairman, Bisha Konde, was elected by consensus. After him, John Oyegu, His Excellency, was also elected by consensus. After him, Adam Zoshimo, a comrade, was also elected by consensus. There have never been a time APC elected a national chairman through elections or through the ballot boxes. What is the reason for not even coming up again with a consensus chairman, since it has become our tradition? to the National Assembly, where the Constitution Amendment Committees in both the Senate and the House of Representatives today laid their reports in their chambers ahead of the vote on the review next week. There was, however, a rare appearance by the wife of the President, Mrs. Aisha Buhari, at the plenary sessions, accompanied by some female ministers. Mrs. Buhari was first at the Senate to throw her weight behind an item for amendment in the 1999 Constitution, which seeks specific seats to be created for female legislators before she was later admitted into the House chamber. Our correspondent Linda Akigbe reports. The wife of the President, Mrs. Aisha Buhari, and her entourage walking into the Senate chamber. Lawmakers suspend their rules to admit her into the chamber. This is the first time a spouse of a serving president is attending plenary in the National Assembly since the return to democracy in 1999. Mrs. Buhari is here to support gender bills put forward for constitution amendment. This is a report on the constitution review and the presence of the first lady is especially to show her support for one of the bills that want to create an affirmative action for more female parliamentarians in both chambers in the Senate and the House and the state legislatures. Deputy Senate President Ovie Omagege, who chairs the Special Ad Hoc Committee 
on the review of the 1999 Constitution lays the Constitution Amendment reports. There are six to eight items for amendment in the 1999 Constitution. They include amendment for financial autonomy for local governments, financial independence of state houses of assembly and state judiciary, amendment for the procedure for passing the Constitution alteration bill where the president withholds assent, strengthening the judiciary for timely dispensation of justice. From the Senate, Mrs. Buhari heads to the House of Representatives. The First Lady is here. The Speaker of the House of Representatives notes the three provisions which will affect women directly, promising support, but insists that it will not be easy. Every man here is a he for she, but there's still a lot of work to be done yet. Um, we're still in the process, and there's still a lot of uh, a lobbying, a lot of lobbying to be done on both houses. As she leaves Parliament, Mrs. Buhari speaks on her mission to the National Assembly. We are here this afternoon to observe, to peacefully observe the, the proceedings on constitutional review about women and also to listen to the proceedings also concerning the 45, 35 affirmative action about women and special seats and special additional seats for women in the National Assembly. Female lawmakers stress the importance of passing constitutional amendment bills for gender parity. We'll give it our best shot to make sure that women in Nigeria have a say because it starts from lawmaking. If we are making laws, okay, look at constitutional amendment. We are going to vote by simple majority. How many women are there? Federal lawmakers in the Senate and House of Representatives are expected to commence voting on the Constitution bills from March 1st, 2022. Thereafter, the bills eventually passed will be sent to the state houses of assembly also for voting. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. And staying with the legislature, the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs has summoned the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, for failing to appear before it to defend a proposed amendment to the 2022 Appropriation Act. The chairman of the committee, Buba Yakubu, explained that the minister was invited before the committee to explain why the ministry was asking for an amendment of its 2022 budget. According to him, the committee had discovered in its scrutiny of the budget that funds were allocated to mission buildings and staff accommodation. I, I Senator Hassan Mohamed Busson, Blue Sun West Square, that I will be faithful and there to our allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria as the British government. Except as may be required. For the new discharge of my duties. For the new discharge of my duties. As a deputy governor. So help me God. And there you have Senator Mohammed Hassan Nasiha being sworn in as the deputy governor of Zamfara State shortly after he was confirmed by the State House of Assembly. Senator Nasiha, who until now represented Zamfara Central in the upper legislative chamber, was sworn in by the chief judge of Zamfara State, Justice Kulu Aliu. His appointment follows the impeachment earlier today of the former deputy governor Mahadi Aliu Guso by the State House of Assembly for abuse of office. The state governor, Bello Matawale, said the decision to immediately swear in a new deputy governor became imperative so that the constitutional duties of a deputy governor in the state can now be effectively performed. Going by the degree of the new deputy governor, most especially his excellent record of political accomplishment, his excellent interpersonal relationship, his accessibility and closeness to his political constituency, I am confident that His Excellency Senator Hassan Mohammed Nasiha Muso is just the right person for this amiable question. <laughs> but also someone that will deploy his vast experience in our relentless pursuits of building a new Zamora state. While I congratulate you for attaining this speech, let me remind you that you are taking over this onerous 
responsibility at a time when the poor state more than any time before need the service of competent and capable hands to join ranks to address a myriad of challenges. In part two of the break, talks between the federal government and the academic staff union of universities adjourn till next Monday. That's in a moment. Do join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Fresh signals emerge on the president's readiness to sign the reworked electoral bill on Friday. Frosty relations between Zamfara governor and his second in command culminate in the impeachment of Deputy Governor Ali Ugusso by the State House of Assembly. National Assembly receives constitutional amendment reports from the Senate and House committees as First Lady visits both chambers to witness laying of reports. A United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres warns that the world is facing a moment of peril over Ukraine and Russia tension. between the federal government and the academic staff union of universities ended last night without a sign of ending the ongoing industrial action by the lecturers. The Minister of Labour and Employment, Chris Ngege, told journalists that the meeting was adjourned to Monday next week when the government hopes to give feedback to the lecturers on some of the issues raised. He, however, noted that agreement was reached on the issues around payment platforms. We have agreed on new tests now. Yes. We're going to uh, uh, do a joint test, both technical teams, and they find uh, the areas of uh, reconciliation because new tests on its own is a homegrown system. And uh, executive order, presidential order three and five encourages homegrown system, local content. So we, we should be able to encourage them. And that's uh, what I, I told them. But they, they have this uh, uh, phobia, uh, I can say suspicion, that government doesn't want anything other than IPs. And I kept on telling them, no matter what system you have, no matter what solution you have, you must have a handshake with IPs so that the government will know about their funds and their movement of the funds. So that is it. So many things. Uh, you know, countries go to war because of uh, lack of information or misinformation. So I'm asking them to brief their people appropriately and then call off the strike before the, uh, the expiration of the time they're talking about. So by Monday, uh, I will have got back to, on, to them on some of the issues and invite them back for the for the discussion. Let's cross over to Abuja now. Here's Markwe Ogunyusuf. Markwe? Hello, Ijoma. Let's start at the court, shall we? Former governor of Imo State, Senator Rocha Sakoracha, says he's not evading service of any kind from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Reacting to the submission made by the council to the EFCC on his unavailability for his arraignment for criminal charges, Senator Okoracha, who represents Imo West constituency, explained that there is a subsistent court order restraining the EFCC from making use of any investigations it has carried out. He also maintained that he has been in communication with the EFCC for the release of his passport. The scheduled arraignment of Senator Okoracha at the Federal High Court in Abuja was stalled yesterday following his absence. Counsel to the EFCC had told the court that effecting service on him had proved abortive. Meanwhile, the management of Kubwa General Hospital Abuja has denied admitting as one of its patients a former Minister of Aviation, Femi Fanikaudi. Through its head of medical records, Mr. Basi Ama, the hospital told Justice Olubumi Abike Fadipe of the Lagos State Special Offenses Court, sitting in Ikeja, that a medical report presented in court by the former minister was not issued by the hospital. Mr. Ama, who is the first prosecution witness in the case, says that Mr. Fanikaude is not a patient and has no medical report in the hospital. 
Mr. Fanika Ode is standing trial before the court on a 12-count charge of procurement of a fabricated medical report and use of the false document. The defendant, however, pleaded not guilty to the charge. At the resumed hearing of the matter before Justice Abike Fadikbe today, the witness testified that the doctor who purportedly signed the medical report tendered by the former minister is not a doctor at the Kubwa General Hospital. Justice Abike Fadikbe has adjourned to February the 25th, 2022, for continuation of the trial. Staying with the judiciary, the National Industrial Court sitting in Ikoi, Lagos, has fixed May the 3rd for judgment in the case filed by over a thousand bank workers affected by the recapitalization exercise of 2006. Justice Paul Bassey fixed the date after parties adopted their final addresses in the matter. The defendants in the suit at the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, and the Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC. The chairman of the former bank workers, Magnus Madoka, said they're committed to pursuing the case to a logical conclusion. The case is a case we started uh, with about uh, 2006 when our banks lost our operating licenses to the policy of Central Bank of Nigeria that wanted banks to consolidate to a minimum of 25 billion naira per bank. We lost our licenses and the way Central Bank managed the liquidation is most unacceptable to us. So we came to court. We are here today for ad ad uh, the adoption of all the cases but by, by all parties. Hopefully, by the time we come back May the 3rd, 2022, it will be for judgment from what the judge told us today. But we're still in the courts, and this time, the Court of Appeal, Abuja, has upheld the judgment of the Federal High Court, which set aside the candidacy of Andy Uba as candidate of the All Progressives Congress in the recent governorship election in Anambra State. In a unanimous judgment delivered by Justice Danlami Zenchi, the appellate court dismissed the appeals brought by Andy Uba and the APC against the judgment of the trial court for lack of merit. The judge held that the plaintiff, George Mogalu, succeeded in proving that the APC did not conduct a valid primary election, which Mr. Andy Uba claimed to have won as a party's flag bearer in the November 6, 2021 election. Consequently, he ordered the Independent National Electoral Commission to delete Mr. Uba's name from its record as a candidate in the election. And more court stories now. Justice Obiora Egwatu of the Federal High Court Abuja has ordered the interim forfeiture of about 10 properties and funds in banks allegedly owned by former governor of Zamfara State, Abdulaziz Yari. The judge gave the order while ruling on an expertise application by a counsel to the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, Osuebeni Akwamitsina. Some of the properties, according to the ICPC, are in Maryland, Abuja, and Kaduna. According to Justice Egwatu, the interim order will last for an initial 60 days to enable the ICPC to conclude its investigation, following which the commission would apply for final forfeiture. The judge further ordered the ICPC to publicize the order for any person or persons with interest in the affected properties to show cause within 14 days why they should not be permanently forfeited to the federal government. And away from the courts now to some bilateral relations, Jamaica has expressed its readiness to partner with Nigeria in the areas of oil and gas, education, agriculture and trade. The Jamaican Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade disclosed this at the opening fourth session of the Nigeria-Jamaica Joint Commission in Abuja. At the event, Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Oyama, says Nigeria is determined to build on the agreements that the two countries have reached during his visit to Jamaica in 2021. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. It's the fourth session of the Nigeria-Jamaica Joint Commission and the two countries are meeting in Abuja to deliberate on how to deepen their bilateral relations. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyema, and the Jamaican Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Kamina Smith, as well as Niger's High Commissioner to Jamaica, Dr. Maureen Tamuno, are in attendance. 
Mr. Nyema expresses Nigeria's determination to build on the agreements the two countries have entered into. We are determined that these joint commissions uh, should not be just an annual or biannual ritual. Uh, we're going to try and put in place mechanisms, monitoring, uh, to make sure that we give real effect and practical uh, effect to, uh, to what we sign up to and what we agree to. Uh, because it's been uh, far too long that uh, a very, very important part uh, of the globe for us, the real priority for us, uh, the Caribbean, uh, that we've been too far uh, apart. Uh, so we really want to bring um, a, a big push uh, at all the various levels, the technical levels, but the people-to-people -people, uh, level very important, and, um, you know, at the cultural level. For the Jamaican Foreign Affairs Minister, there are even more areas to explore by the two countries. The government of Jamaica, again, reiterates our appreciation to the government of Nigeria for the periodic deployment of nurses, artisans, and tutors over the years under the Technical Aid Corps program. It is envisioned that our discussions during the meeting today and tomorrow will give rise to the revitalization and expansion of these stable programs within our agenda. We look forward to exploring prospects in oil and gas, mining, trade in agricultural and non-agricultural products, and wider investment opportunities. We welcome, indeed, the government does, this opportunity to explore the potential to strengthen and deepen our bilateral relationship in these areas. Nigeria and Jamaica have maintained bilateral relations for over 50 years, and this fourth joint commission is expected to further strengthen the partnership between the two countries. Emperor Simon, Channels, Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, House of Representatives calls for investigation into rising cases of fake insurance certificate issuance in the country. That's some business news. Do join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. The National Emergency Management Agency has received a total of 159 stranded Nigerian returnees from Libya. The returnees who were assisted back to Nigeria arrived the cargo wing of the Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Ikeja, aboard an Al Burak Air around 7 p.m. today. The returnees include 80 adult females, four female children, and one infant female, where there are 67 adult males, six male children, and one male infant. The Director General of NEMA, who was represented by the Lagos Territorial Office Coordinator, Ibrahim Farinloye, advised the returnees to be advocates against irregular migration to other youths who may think there are greener pastures elsewhere. And it was a joyful moment for the Methodist Church of Nigeria in River State today as the presiding pastor of Salvation Ministries, Pastor David Ibiome, handed over a multi-million naira building he reconstructed for the church's missionary school, Banham Methodist Academy. The academy, which Pastor Ibiome attended as a pupil, was established over a hundred years ago and was run down for years until the cleric's intervention last year. This day will remain a memorable one for the Methodist Church of Nigeria in River State as the presiding pastor of Salvation Ministries, David Ibiume, visits its headquarters in Port Harcourt with his wife, Peace, to hand over this reconstructed building to the Methodist Missionary School. Until Ibiume's intervention last year, Banham Methodist Academy, which he attended between 1969 and 1974, was a one-story dilapidated colonial structure with not more than 10 classrooms. It's now a two-story contemporary building with 16 classrooms, a crutch, laboratories, library and offices for teaching and non-teaching staff. Greeted with a heartwarming reception by the church leadership, the school management, students and the Old Boys Association, Pastor Ibiomir commissions the building to signify the official handing over. So the clerk, put the name of God the Father. Amen. The name of God the Son. Amen. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
The elated Archbishop of the Methodist Church says the act exemplifies the principle of charity and the unity in the body of Christ. I just came in here, very cool ones, taking over from my predecessor. I have heard your news. I've heard you. I've watched you. I've listened to you. And I've seen you today. You're a man of action. For what you have done, I think it's a very good lesson to so many other people. But you are not a person that is cowed within an area. You are a man that God has given the gift and the talent to impact upon life. For the donor, giving back to society is the essence of Christianity. Life is all I said about contribution. If you are contributing nothing to humanity, there's no point existing. So I felt a place that has blessed my life, I should also contribute my little way to the place that have affected me positively. So that's why we have just come to do what we have done. It's not all that you have that matters, but what you give to people. This donation is to help improve the learning condition of these students. System Specs, one of Africa's software and financial technology giants, is celebrating its 30th anniversary. At an event marking the occasion, the group managing director, John Obaro, is excited about the company's impact in Nigeria and the continent. When System Specs started in February 1992, the intention of its 33-year-old founder, John Obaro, was to become a solution provider. Between then and now, the company has grown beyond initial expectation, its flagship product being Remita, a payment platform. It's been 30 years of its existence, risen staff, executive and management board members are rolling out a drum. We thought of developing a solution to speak to that. It was in the course of developing that solution that we then started extending it. Okay that not only would it remit pensions, it should remit taxes, it should remit cooperatives, and of course it should remit the immediate salaries for staff, all at the press of one button. Now with a 300 staff strength, the company is expanding its operations and will now function as three entities. System Specs has um, existed for 30 years offering um, impactful products in the areas of um, payments and collection as well as human resource management. Our flagship product, Remita, um, is the leading payments and collection application. Mr. Ernest Ndekwe is taking over from Dr. Christopher Colladi as chairman of SystemSpex board. is promising to bring integrity and his wealth of experience in ICT to the company. I see SystemSpec as a company that will grow much bigger than it is today, will be a major contributor to ICT in Nigeria because it's an ICT company of note. It will continue to be providing the leadership in the industry. Mr. Emmanuel Choli is an investor and one of those who knew how the company started. Within two years of my investing in the company, I had reaped at least 10 times what I invested. And as a finance person, as a friend, I told him to buy, buy me out. God, focus, vision, innovation, and diligence are some of the factors Mr. Barra attributed success to. Work continues, so also the celebration and plans to unveil a series of year-long initiatives including Awareness Health Talk, Children's DSA Competition, Graduate Internship Program and lots more. Customers of Chi Limited are in for a treat with the launch of a new drink known as Chivita Smart Classic Malt Drink into the market. At the unveiling of the drink today in Lagos, the company says the latest innovation looks set to position the Chivita brand to meet the needs of consumers, particularly children. Business partners and key distributors of Chi Limited are gathered at the Sheraton Hotel and Towers, Lagos, for this special event, along with the managing director of the company. You're getting even more margins from this product. Chi Limited is introducing Chivita Smart Classic Malt Drink to the Nigerian market. 
The company says this innovation is a testament to its desire to meet the quality needs of consumers, especially children between the ages of 6 and 12. I'm super excited about today, and I'm also super excited about the future, because we have a great opportunity ahead of us. Made from natural extract and specially for kids, it comes in a ready-to-drink pack of 125 ml, comprising 24 units per carton, rich in vitamins A, B1, B2, B6 and E, and comes at an affordable price. The company says the drink captures the aspirations of parents and kids to stay healthy with the energy to learn and play. The product is finally unveiled by the managing director of Chi Limited. launching into a category that is very visible and very much loved by consumers. But we're coming out with something unique and different. It's a steel malt beverage, specially packed in the 125 ml pack, specific for our younger aged consumers. So we're very confident that we're delivering a great tasting product, highly nutritious product in an attractive and engaging packaging. This product comes with unique proposition in the fact in the sense that it contains so much vitamins and it contains so much nutrients that are good for the well-being of our kids. That's not all. The managing director and sales director of the company have more words for customers. We have high expectations. This is a fantastic company with fantastic brands that have been a household name in Nigeria since 1980. And we believe that there's a lot in store for, our, for Nigerians as well as people outside of Nigeria for this fantastic, these fantastic brands. We have yogurt you know, that is in packs that children love, both strawberry and plain yogurt. And what we've done is to also present you know, malt drink in the form that children will really, really enjoy. With the launch of the new Chivita Smart Malt for Kids, Chi Limited looks poised to strengthen its position for the Chivita brand and dominates the food and beverages market in 2022 and beyond. And for the rest of the business news, here's Anne Waudu. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Ijoma. Hello and welcome to Business News. The House of Representatives has mandated its Committee on Insurance and Actuarial Matters to investigate the incidence of fake insurance certificates in the country. The resolutions at today's plenary follows the adoption of a motion of the matter by Honorable Oluyemi Adewale Taiwo. While representing the motion, the lawmaker also pointed out that insurance companies and brokerage must be operational offices and they must have them in major cities across the country. The statutory laws of the country stipulate that no motorist should fly Nigeria road without having a genuine insurance certificate. However, most motorists have continued to show absolute disregard for the statutory requirements. He has also worried that the number of vehicles with fake certificates on Nigeria road has risen to 9.4 million, and the figure released by the Nigeria Insurance Association revealed that only 2.72 million vehicles on Nigeria Road have valid insurance covers as of February 2021. I was also worried that the millions of vehicles, trucks, motorcycles flying Nigeria roads are not insured. The House hereby resolved to urge the insurance companies and brokerage to have operational offices in major cities, cities of the country. He has also mandated the Committee on Insurance and Actual Matters to investigate the incidence of fake insurance advocates in Nigeria and report back within six weeks for further legislative action. From the insurance sector to the oil and gas sector, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies are expected to meet on March the 2nd to decide the next line of action over the agreeable amount of oil its members will pump in the month of April. And this is coming as two key OPEC members, Nigeria and Iraq, affirmed that the strategy employed by the 23-nation alliance to gradually raise oil production is enough to balance the global oil market. Nigeria's Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Demi Press Silva, 
told reporters attending an oil event in Doha, the capital in Qatar, that there's no need to supply more barrels of crude oil than the current plan, as the market will be expecting more production if a nuclear deal with Iran works out. And talking about crude oil, the prices have rebounded from the losses recorded yesterday as Ukraine declares a state of emergency after the government and bank's website were affected by a cyber attack amid lingering tensions with Russia. Brent crude rose by 1.5% to $98.32 a barrel today, and that's after hitting $99.50 a barrel yesterday, which is its highest since September 2014. While it's contemporary, the U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude jumped by 1.2% to $92.10 a barrel at the same time. Meanwhile, analysts are expecting oil prices to continue seeing support from the Russia-Ukraine crisis, with some Western countries promising to impose more sanctions if Russia launches a full invasion. And let's head to the local stock market now. It ended midweek trading session negative, reversing some of its gains recorded yesterday. Layu Adegoke has the details for us. Thanks a lot for joining us for the stock market report. Call it a bloody day on the NGX and you won't be wrong. And that's because trading activities ended midweek session mostly in the red. No thanks to renewed profit taken by short-term investors. <laughs> Well, that's the bear there. Now more than 21 billion naira is knocked off from the gains recorded in the last three sessions on the equity market after sell pressure hit the share price of GT Co, UBA, Lafarge, ETI and 14 other stocks, forcing the all share index to drop by 0.08% today. Now the impact of the sell pressure, which comes amid a positive market breadth of 24 gainers against 16 losers, was also felt across four out of the five key sectors of listed equities. In particular, the insurance counter, which fell by nearly 1%. On the activity chart, the volumes of shares traded was lower by 45.33%, value fell by 32.83%, while the number of deals carried out dropped by 26.96%, and that's when compared to, you know, the previous day's turnover. Well, it may appear that the equities market is losing steam as the month gradually winds down, but traders say the market remains dynamic and may spring up, who knows, some positive surprise within the remaining days of February. And that's it on the stock market report. I'm Layo. I did go key. Well, let's hope that rebound happens, Lyo. And for other markets around the world, they were mostly red also today. Investors are still continuing to monitor the lingering tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Let's see the closing numbers for Wednesday. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Ijoma. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says we're in one of the most serious global peace and security crises in recent years, referring to the tensions going on between Russia and Ukraine. It comes as the Ukrainian government calls on its citizens to leave Russia immediately, days after Russia ordered troops into the two breakaway regions after recognizing their independence. President Volodymyr Zelensky has also mobilized Ukraine's military reserves. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Ukraine has imposed a state of emergency on all of its territory and told around three million of its citizens in Russia to return. 
The country's security chief has also called for a first wave of reservists aged 18 to 60 to join the regular armed forces. We reached, uh, Ukraine's foreign minister has called on the West to impose tougher sanctions against Vladimir Putin's inner circle. It's after the US, UK and others announced measures against Russian individuals and banks. A U.S. space technology company has published several satellite images showing what it says are new troop and equipment deployments in western Russia and more than 100 vehicles in southern Belarus, all close to Ukraine's borders. Earlier, Vladimir Putin took part in a wreath-laying ceremony near the Kremlin. He later said that Russia was always open to diplomacy but put its own national security interests first and would continue to strengthen its military in the face of what he called a difficult international situation. Dutch police have overpowered a hostage taker by knocking him down with a police vehicle as he ran out of an Apple store in Amsterdam. Officers sealed off the area after a 44-year-old British man was held at gunpoint in the flagship store. The hostage managed to run free with the gunman eventually being run over by a police car. The man who had a gun was searched for explosives by a robot and later arrested. The U.S. is to deploy hundreds of unarmed National Guard troops to Washington ahead of the arrival of trucker convoys protesting against pandemic restrictions. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin approved a request from the District of Columbia government and the U.S. Capitol Police. The roughly 700 troops will be deployed on various roads in Washington. The U.S. trucker convoys aim to replicate recent trucker protests in Canada, which paralyzed the capital, Ottawa. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro says that two military personnel were killed and two others injured during a helicopter crash in the western state of Lara. In videos, locals can be seen gathering near the helicopter's burning debris. The aircraft belonged to Venezuela's armed forces and was made in Russia. Eyewitnesses say two of the helicopter's crew members managed to get out of the flames with the help of locals. Wildfires herald a future of greater flammability around the world. That's according to two new reports. Indonesia's peatlands, California's forests and now vast swathes of Argentina's wetland have all been ravaged by extreme fires in recent weeks and months. With climate change fueling droughts and farmers slashing forests, the number of extreme wildfires is expected to increase 30% within the next 28 years. Uh, globally, we will see uh, a higher prevalence of more severe fires, larger fires with more impacts on the environment and society. Rescuers in the Brazilian neighborhood that was severely devastated by landslides are still racing against time in search for signs of life. As the death toll continues to rise, one week after the mudslides and flash floods slammed the city of Petropolis in Brazil, the search for survivors is going on in the Villa Philippe neighborhood, one of the disaster relief hotspots. The rescue teams at the site said there could be victims underneath the mud and that careful work should be conducted to search for them. One person has died and at least 10 are missing after heavy flooding in Australia's Sunshine Coast. Roads and streets are underwater after torrential rainfall pummeled southeast Queensland. Floodwaters rose to over four and a half feet in some parts, covering roads and stranding vehicles as rescue personnel were deployed to help with the search and rescue. The body of a woman was found in a submerged vehicle, while ten others are still reported missing. And finally, fresh from the national team's victory in the Africa Cup of Nations this month, Senegal has inaugurated a new 50,000-seat stadium. The ceremony, attended by African and European heads of state and global sporting dignitaries, the Turkish-built Abdullah Wade Stadium in Senegal's new showpiece city of Diamniado is part of a drive by President Macky Sall to develop the West African country's infrastructure. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. British WBO cruiserweight champion Lawrence Okoli will face challenger Poland's Michael Cieslak on Sunday 
February the 27th in what could well be his last fight in the division. Okoli's second defense of the title he won in March 2021 will still go ahead at the London's O2 Arena, despite the recent damage caused by the Storm Eunice before he considers a potential move up to heavyweight. His opponent, Cizlak, have only one loss on his 22-bout record, but is widely expected to struggle on Sunday, with Okoli strongly believed to have the capability of making light work of his opponent. And Nigeria have qualified for the finals of this year's Women's Africa Cup of Nations Championship after the Super Falcons beat the hosts, Lady Elephants of Côte d'Ivoire, 1-0 in Abidjan earlier today. The scoreline meant an aggregate of 3-0 for the nine-time African champions. A minute to the end, Esther Okoronko, winning only her second cap for Nigeria, scored the backbreaker that handed the Super Falcons the ticket. Victory and qualification for Morocco 2022 was sweet revenge over the Lady Elephants, who bumped the Falcons on the road to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And football action returned in the Nigerian Women Football League earlier today after a two-week break with March Day 8 matches. Twelve goals were recorded with one away win. Niger Rattels beat Pelican Stars 3-0. Rivers Angels recorded the only away win with a 2-0 win against Sunshine Queens. Confluence Queens beat Nasara Amazons 1-0. FC Robo of Lagos defeated Royal Queens 3-1. Delta Queens, meanwhile, defeated Abia Angels 2-0. And in Europe, Manchester United forced Atletico Madrid to a one-all draw in the first leg of their round of 16 tie at the Estadio Wanda Metropolitano. Yao Felix header in seventh minute of the game from a Renan Lodi whips gave Diego Simeone's men the lead in the first half. Anthony Elanga got the equaliser on the 80th minute to level the score ahead of the return leg at Old Trafford in two weeks. Benfica and Ajax played a two-all draw in the other round of 16 match in Portugal. And former world number one Andy Murray has knocked out, has been knocked out of the Dubai Tennis Championships by Italian Yannick Sinner earlier today. The world number 10 did not face a break point as he beat the 34-year-old Scott 7-5-6-2 to set up a quarterfinal against Hubert Hurkacz of Poland. Three-time Grand Slam champion Murray won the Dubai Championship the last time he played there in 2017 and was looking for his 700th tall-level career win. Five, That's a wrap on sports news. It's back to you, Jama, with the wrap of the news at 10. And Victor Mathias, thank you for watching. Thanks a lot, Victor. And the main news again. Fresh signals emerged today that President Muhammad Buhari will sign the reworked electoral bill on Friday after earlier indications that it might happen today failed. Also today, the Federal High Court Abuja ordered the interim forfeiture of about 10 properties and funds in banks allegedly owned by a former governor of Zamfara State, Abdul Aziz Yari. Some of the properties are in Maryland, in the United States of America, Abuja and Kaduna. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Bonyato. Good night. <laughs>